Welcome to another episode of Coronavirus. I'm Dr. Mike Hansen. For those of you who don't know me, and I am wearing a mask along with this gentleman right here by the name of Dr. Hizbe Ali. For those of you who don't know me, I am a board certified physician specializing in internal medicine, pulmonary disease, that's lungs, and critical care medicine. Dr. Ali is double board certified in psychiatry, uh, so general psychiatry, as well as consultation liaison psychiatry. Yep. So, hey, man, thanks for coming on. Mike, thanks for having me. Um, we go back, by the way, we go back to medical school days, so that's kind of why we're on first term basis. And uh, So, yeah, I mean, I've always known him as a lefty. Like, <laughs> yeah. I probably said his first name four times in my life, and this is the fifth time probably. Yeah, so it feels weird. But, yeah. you know, we are, you know, we've played music together, so we, we know each other. We really actually well. met in med school at St. George's. So our girlfriends at the time, uh, we they were vet students, and we were at some 80s party, and they were playing Sweet Child of Mine by Guns N' Roses. <laughs> And out it, of all the other we were, like crappy 80s songs, yeah. you know, Guns N' Roses was the best. There, there was a highlight, everything right. else was pop 80s, like, so yeah. it was dumb. Uh, yeah, and so, like, <laughs> no we're offense, like, dude, exactly. you like Guns N' Roses? Like, yeah, me too. Yeah. And then that's basically how we became friends. That is correct. Yeah, so we've been friends ever since. Um, that was back in 2004. Yeah, yeah, yeah. wow, damn, I feel old now. Yeah, we are, <laughs> we're old. But fast um, forward 16 years later, you've yeah. been practicing psychiatry. You're done with your training. You finished your fellowship training three years ago. Yeah. Well, uh, actually, it's like four, almost five years ago. So you've been a practicing yeah. double board psychiatrist for about four, four years now. Years, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Most people think, well, what's a psychiatrist have to do with coronavirus and COVID? Well, obviously, a lot of people are stressed out right now, have anxiety, depression. For example, I have right now is Sturgis, okay? So rewind three months ago, and one of my patients with COPD, she's on home oxygen, supplemental oxygen, two liters nasal cannula. Uh, she's very fearful of getting the virus with understandable reason. Yep. She works in a grocery store in the bakery section, and three months ago, she was like, I please, please, I really hope that Sturgis is canceled this year. Well, of course it's not, it's happening right now. And She's very anxious about it. That was back then. I can't even imagine how she is now. I'll probably be seeing her pretty soon, but she's, yep. she took as much time off from work as she could and it still wasn't enough because she just does not want to be exposed to people where she works. And this is despite her wearing a mask and everything. And the yep. mask doesn't necessarily protect you from getting it, but it can actually help from the respiratory droplets going both ways. Although this mask that we're wearing is mainly to prevent you, if you were to have the virus, spreading that virus through respiratory droplets when you talk or cough or sneeze. And that's why we're wearing the mask now, just because we're, you know, we're kind of close. But I didn't want to pass up on this opportunity to have you here and uh, let the audience know uh, your expertise on psychiatry as it relates to coronavirus. Okay, well, yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, and, you know, thanks for, like, having me on this um, platform, you know, you have done an amazing job, you and your colleagues in the field. Um, so obviously you know a lot more about the science behind it and a lot more of like, you know, uh, pandemics, the whole public health of, of pandemics and stuff. So I'm not even gonna try to, to, to even talk about that. I'm sure you have plenty of experts on that. Um, I, I'm really just gonna, I wanna talk from personal experience from psychiatry. You know, I work in an emergency department, uh, CPEP, which is, you know, more of a comprehensive psychiatric kind of uh, examination program. Uh, and it's sort of, um, uh, what I, you, it's, it's funny you mentioned Sturgis because I work in New York. I work in New York, Long Island, Stony Brook Hospital, the CPEP there. And uh, we were the epicenter of when this whole thing broke out, right? When the pandemic first broke out, New York was the, the biggest hit. And at that time, there were measures taken by the governor and the mayor that were not very popular um, because people weren't seeing necessarily the you know it's not like you know some apocalyptic scene or, or what's that you know walking dead where people are literally turning to zombies and dying within you know a short amount of time so i think what happened was that people were skeptical then they saw the numbers um and new york took some really they did take some drastic measures and they did like a complete shutdown basically you know um total shutdown isolation quarantine all of that and a lot of businesses were affected by this so you know they're 
America, interestingly enough, is one of those is is a rare country. It's it's rare compared to almost any other country because it has such a、um, heterogeneous population and、um, political and philosophical and religious beliefs that no other country is quite like it. You can, it's hard to marshal all these. Um, you know,、uh, kind of various, not only ethnic but、um, you know, demographic, generational、uh, persons, clash, and、uh, ideological, political, all in, and to, to you know, do something that really does like take almost the head of a state, like authoritarian, almost kind of you know, say to say, hey, we're doing this, we're imposing this on everybody, and that's it, and everyone has to toe the line, fall in line, or face consequences. America actually allows dissent, which is which is what the country. Is built on, which is amazing, and so you got to take the good with the bad. So part of the bad was that I think that people fell along political divides, and they felt that okay, the president is saying one thing, the 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 World Health Organization organization is saying something else, doctors in this country are saying something else. There's even divide between the doctors, like there wasn't, and this was kind of a new thing. So、uh, it's not like we knew that much about the virus, anyways. So I'll I'll give a lot of the doctors that like we didn't know that much. But the one thing about a pandemic, I think that almost you know even if you watch that movie Contagion, I don't know if you ever watched the movie Contagion. It's Matt Damon. It's I've from, seen clips of it. It's a good one. It, it's、um, uh, from 2010 or 11, and they kind kind of predicted what would happen. And I think they based their model off of like SARS, and of course they dramatized. It's Hollywood. They dramatized where like millions of people dying. But a lot of if you watch the movie. Is what has come to fruition, actually,、um, and especially in this kind of like society,、uh, modern society of like, you know, social media. Everything is like hyper sensationalized, and everyone's opinion is out there. So it's almost like unfiltered, twenty four、right. hour hyper sensationalized. Everyone has a voice. Everyone has a voice, and some of those voices, if they're charming or they're a voice that's known to someone. Like that, they've been you know on the news network for、uh, however many years. Their known voice, they trust them, right? They trust them, and so、uh, unfortunately, those voices, there's not you know they've been divided along political lines. It's not really like the way news used to be, where we just reported numbers、right. were reported. Where I, I don't know, you know, I'm I'm more of like a history buff or whatever. But like when the Vietnam War was happening, for example, you just reported casualties. I don't think any of the anchors actually reported like this is what we believe and we think the war should end or not. They just said these are how many. Viet Cong are dying. There's how many American are dying. There's how many、uh, civilians are dying, and that's actually what swerved the opinion to, against the war was just numbers. Now, for example, because you kind of touched on this a little bit, you mentioned even doctors. Some of them are divided. Yeah. Most of them are not. Most of them are, you know, all saying the same thing that I'm saying. But also, you're a psychiatrist, and this actually came to my mind when I saw this. There is a Houston doctor who is originally from. One of the countries in Africa, and I think she practiced or she did her training in Nigeria, and then she came to the United States and did further training. And I believe she's a either internal medicine, I think she's internal medicine combined pediatrics trained. I could be wrong, but anyway, she's the one who got in front of the microphone.、Uh, I believe she's in Washington D.C.、Yeah. on in front of a podium, basically saying how she's on a mission, come hell or high water, to. Say that hydroxychloroquine saves lives. Every doctor I know says she's crazy, and and that's before I even heard that she believes that ovarian problems is a result of ladies having demon semen from men. <laughs> right. So yeah. yeah so so here's the thing. So yeah, the whole hydroxychloroquine. I'm not even going to get into that debate. Yeah. That's already been shown multiple times until it's proven where it's a randomized controlled trial. Look, if hydroxychloroquine worked, I'd be the first one to be giving、sure. it to patients. Everyone would be. Absolutely. You know, we all want a, a miracle. We all want a cure. We all want this to go away. Okay. So it's not like we don't want that. It's just if it doesn't work and if it's causing more harm than good, we're not going to give it. So,、yeah. um, and who really knows if it works or not? How do you know if it works or not? There's、yeah. only one way to know, and that's if you actually do the studies. Arbitrary, you know, anecdotal experience. That's not. That doesn't cut it. That's not science. We do things that are science based. When you have an infection caused by bacteria, and we give an antibiotic for it, and you get better, why does that happen? That's all a result of science. That was, that was years of study and science that has already been gone down that path, and it's been proven. And that's how we know that ceftriaxone is going to cure Neisseria、uh, bacteria infection. 
I mean, we know this, right? Yeah. So, so it, it, you know, the science has rules and it doesn't change according to political philosophy or whatever reason. But what right. I want to ask you is, because to me, you know, claiming that uh, demon semen from men causes <laughs> ovarian problems, <laughs> obviously no doctor is going to agree with that. So you True. have you have bad apples in every profession, right? Yeah. Whether it's police, whether it's office workers, no matter what it is, you're going to have bad apples in every profession. Or, or just severely misinformed. You're you're right. When I said like you know there's uh, there's few people that probably and I would say this similar to like and you know like when the autism you know thing with ra- debate was raging and there was that guy in England that said hey it's you know related to vaccines. Look at how many people he affected. That you're right. That was one person. It really just takes a few scientists that are you know outside of the mainstream they're they're outside the mainstream of scientists and most mainstream science like 99 percent mike is right are fall into the realm of empirical evidence because that is what science is anything outside of that is not you know it, it, it is just speculative really at best and so in the case of corona of course we don't know that much at all so but the one thing we do know is what how pandemic pandemics spread and how to contain them and so you're right on that. I think what happened was there are a few doctors. I don't know if they were maybe bought by political parties or that's just, you know, or maybe they were a here's, little bit. Here's my my takeaway. It's either bought by a political party, you know, self-gain, monetary, financial self-gain. Yeah. Or it reminds me, you know, I'm not a psychiatrist, but I did go to med school once and I learned about you know, mania sounds like she's man. You know, with this demon <laughs> yeah. semen and come or hell, high, come hot hell or high water, right. she's gonna you know. Well, it's also before I would say uh, anything about manic or diagnosing anyone but like that. I'm not I would, saying I'm not saying I'm diagnosing. I'm just saying the way that she presents yeah. herself with this well, grandiosity. There, like, that is there, and you're right. And I would say there's also people with personality disorders, and there's a lot of people with weird, odd beliefs that believe in UFOs and things like that. Right? There's actually no. Which actually recently <laughs> right? wasn't there something about there might <laughs> yeah. Need some more to <laughs> right, right, exactly. So, but there are people out there that lend themselves to odd, weird, bizarre beliefs, and so they're still successful people, right? They still go to schools, medical school, engineering, law school. They just happen, you know, they can be good physicians, but they were lawyers or doctors, or engineers. But sometimes they have these odd magical beliefs that but normally you can't be a good physician if you're telling a woman that. Her ovarian problems are due to a guy's demon semen. Well, you're you're practicing as a physician. Your personal belief should never come into that realm, right? Regardless of whether you right. uh, whether you believe that there is a god, or there is this, there is that, whether there's aliens out there, fine. You keep your beliefs in your home. When you come into practice medicine, you should just work on the empirical evidence and what's going to work. You're right. There's a lot of the, someone like her and a couple other physicians that have been out there. Unfortunately, have created this illusion to the general public that there is a divide between physicians. So when I said that, I meant it actually from their the public's perspective of like there is a divide between physicians. And I'm glad that you clarified that because. For 99% of physicians, maybe even more, 99.5 or 9, there's not, actually. There's not, and they know how, um, you know, contagious in, uh, infections work throughout history. We've had many, many, many examples of this. This isn't something new. And even back in the old days, you know, they still kind of somehow knew, like, we had to isolate people. They knew at least that much. Yeah. Even with the plague, right. they knew at least that much. So it just somehow for me is still a little bit alarming that people think that that's some, something bad that, or, you know, it is, it is distressing and I know it costs a lot of people jobs and stuff, but for public health, if we're looking at public health, there is only one way to contain this. And that's really to look at numbers on a more, on a larger scale, not just your family, your life. Oh, I'm young, I'm healthy. Cause that's the misconception is that most people that don't want to wear a mask think that they're immune or invincible to this illness. I think there's different reasons why people don't want to wear a mask. Yeah. You know, there's lots of reasons. They don't think that they're going to get it. Or if they do get it, they're invincible. Or it could be just, you know, they don't care. Like if they get it, they get it. And that's that. You know, part of that not caring is they don't care if they spread it to others. Or they don't think it's going to happen. I think those are the... And then the other thing is they think it's uh, impinging on their rights to freedom. So... That's a great thing. And that's when I was talking about America as being kind of its own unique, you know, America is really like a crucible of this experiment. It's an experiment on democracy that 
has you know been evolving. It's not perfect. Obviously, we know about all the original sins of America with slavery and this and that, and you know women's rights to vote and stuff. But the good thing is that this experiment has so far been progressing in the right direction. Um, but part of what this experiment is is a balance between individual rights and societal rights. That's right. right? You know, the social contract by Rousseau, uh, who was you know originally uh, penned this kind of this book, um, the philosopher, you know, a French philosopher who penned this book, and he part of the enlightenment and he kind of talked about modern societies being it is a contract between individual rights and the rights of society and we have to sacrifice some rights if we want the greater good to exist it's right? kind of like how you know animals in the animal kingdom including humans back in the day it's like yeah. look if you don't comply with the tribe you're out you're outcast yeah. Yeah, which exactly. essentially means death right so right if you're not complying with societal rules of the tribe you're outcast. Exactly. Now, America, it has this unique thing about individualism because it's, you know, a country that was kind of based off of this, you know, a lot of individual, amazing individuals, no doubt, at least for the la the first 150 years or even, I would say, in this entire existence. You know, we've had amazing uh, people come up with brilliant ideas more than any other country in the world. So, yes, there is this concept and idea that individuals rule. Um, the problem is that those, those individuals, you know, they were very, very unique. And the average person doesn't know that much about what those individuals achieved or accomplished or what they went through. Same way that the average person here doesn't really know about maybe the, 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 the hardcore facts of the science or the pandemic itself. And they tend to put their trust into people that they think do know, such as the government. The government, you would think, would have, you know, a, a little bit of a more cautionistic side to it. When it comes to things like this, like, for example, New York, whether you agree with New York's politics or not, you know, you can call them liberal or socialist. And they you, you, they probably are in terms of they do are there. They're more about social programs and, and social welfare. And now that's a whole nother argument on like how much of this or that. That's part of the social contract. It's still it's an a ongoing. Striking a balance. It's a striking about it's an ongoing struggle. But certain things like this pandemic, there are crises. You know, the AIDS crisis was another one. There were certain crises and pandemics that happened where you have to, you know, government can turn a blind eye. You know, the Reagan administration really didn't want to hear about the AIDS, you know, crisis when that happened. It really took a huge amount of people dying and scientists saying... It this wasn't until you know, then that they're yeah. basically, you know, saying right. they're going to raise hell in order to get that <laughs> right. done. And yeah. it's Dr. Fauci, who's basically kind of like spearheaded that movement in terms of getting medicines right, right. for HIV developed. Exactly. And the first medicine sucked. Right. And now they're great. I mean, the person with HIV now. Is now it's not even, you know, and yeah, it took 20, 30 years of, you know, a struggle to get to this level. But look how amazing it is. There's so many yeah. people's lives that are saved and so many brilliant people that have gone on to actually contribute to humanity. Magic Johnson. Magic Johnson, who's I'm a Lakers yeah. fan. So obviously, you know, he's one of them. But many other people have, have survived this or lived long enough to accomplish, you know, good things for their own lives, but also other people. And I think the problem with the is pandemic is people are very short sighted and they don't want to sacrifice sacrifice their social liberties and look i'm not saying i don't disagree with their sentiment of like you know they're giving up some of their livelihoods or their personal freedoms um but it takes me you know it reminds me of the greatest generation right the greatest generation was the generation of world war ii that sacrificed a lot more than we've ever sacrificed in our right. lives to go win a battle against nazis we had to come together <laughs> we had to come together and honestly if we're gonna beat this it's got to be gotta like that come together yeah it's got to be on that be scale. Divided. we all got to be on the same page Exactly. And, you know, the irony here is we all just, how long has it been going on since, you know, this really started in China late December, but when it yeah. hit the U.S., it officially became a pandemic March 11th. If we just sucked it up for one month and said, yeah. we're shutting everything down, suck it up, this will this will be over. Right. Wouldn't that be nice if we could just yeah. stop talking about and it now? Absolutely. But now, because absolutely. we're not on the same page, it's going to keep lingering. It's not going to go away anytime soon. We're right. not getting a vaccine anytime soon. It's going to take a while. There's too much divide amongst people. Yeah. This country is almost almost evenly spit, split 50-50, you know, between the parties and the parties. Everything is like, if your party says this, I'm opposed to it, regardless of the facts. That's just how American people live their lives. Right. They only follow the news channels they want to follow, whether it's Fox News and America First, or whether it's CNN and MSNBC or whatever. They follow those news channels, and those news channels sensationalize uh, and divide people even more, I think, because no one's ever going to 
be convinced just by watching those news channels. Those news channels have their diehard believers. I've never yet met one person who said, you know what, I watched CNN the other day, I'm convinced. <laughs> it, it, really takes, it really takes being united. And that starts at the top. It takes looking also using like science. Like I don't know when science became politicized. somehow politicized to so the know. thing where it became like, you know what, this thing is a hoax, um, this virus is a hoax. No, viruses have existed forever. And if you ever read, there's some great books out there, by the way, in the history of vi you know, virology, you know, <laughs> virology books about how we've been fighting the battle against viruses since before we even evolved to become homo sapiens. It's not even something new. It's not, you know, contrived this, that. I mean, it's just, it's too many people buying into these hoaxes and it's like, okay, let's just say some there is some virus that's introduced. Let's just say there is bioterrorism, right? Bioterrorism is a real possibility, can happen. Then what? So now there's virus in the Jews. You think just by saying it's a hoax that we're not going to follow it, that we just don't, that we're going to let the virus run rampant. We still have to contain it. I think that's the biggest hurdle, honestly, in just in controlling this pandemic. That's why other countries have been more successful. They've well, you look more, at countries you know, who have been very yeah. successful. Like initially, the, the country that handled best when it first started. What was the country that was next to China? I mean, it's South Korea was the first country that I went to. They, as soon as they saw what was going on in China, they said, look, it's going to come here. Let's get the RNA from the Chinese and let's start making the tests now because it's going to get here. Not only that, but the South Koreans are already experienced with previous uh, SARS, the first SARS yeah, virus. The pandemic they already were yeah. used to wearing masks. They're like, yeah, we got to protect ourselves from viruses. So they're already like on the same page in terms of wearing masks and they already knew about social distancing. And so they were already doing all these things. And plus they had, obviously it's a, it's a step above in terms of government controlling, but they had the apps where, you know, you're going to isolate and they're going to track that. We're not doing that here. Of course, if you think, you know, people aren't going to wear masks, then of course people aren't going to be agreeable to having an app that can track your quarantine. But they were doing these things and they dealt with it in a tremendous way. I mean, they had very low numbers. And then you look at other countries who have done it successfully, uh, Vietnam, New Zealand, Canada, a bunch of countries yeah. that handled it fantastically. And what was the thing that they all did that they all had in common? It's, it's, a, it's what we already know, social distancing, wearing masks, you know, washing your hands. Yeah. And so it's like, we know how to deal with it. Is it inconvenient? Does it suck? Yeah. yeah. But what, what sucks more is the alternative, which is just a lingering pandemic. Yeah, it's exactly. not going to go away. It's like, I'd rather just get one punch to the face than, um, you know, a million, <laughs> right. a million, you know, mosquito bites. You know what I mean? And, and you know, and me and Mike, you know, we're, we're musicians. We love playing music. We love going to see bands. Of course, you know, for us, this is a huge inconvenience. It's way more of an inconvenience to other families, I'm sure. People lost jobs. They lost jobs and and school, you know, having to have, uh, you know, day, uh, child care because, you know, you know, schooling's shut down and all that. So I get it. I get that part of that frustration. And that's where a lot of this kind of pushback to shut down this is happening. However, the counter argument, like you said, is... You know, New York did, I think, an amazing job where everyone was frustrated. And I was in the thick of it. And I had friends that were, you know, very frustrated because they had businesses that were shut down. And they were angry. But you know what? Now those businesses are opening back up and New York has the lowest rate now. Now I want to ask you, what do you, <laughs> yeah. so I want to ask you two questions related to schools. What yeah. do you think on schools reopening? You know, ver, you know, obviously we talk about getting yeah. people together in close quarters. Obviously it's going to spread the virus. And then the opposite of that in terms yeah. of the downside of you know, let's say they're not going to be in schools. What is the psychiatric effect? Because you actually almost got a, another board specialty in adolescent psychiatry. Right. So can you speak to how does that affect child, you know, adolescent development of the mind? Absolutely. Um, yeah. And I mean, I see kids. I work in an emergency department, so I see all age groups. I see kids every day, every night. Um, and adults. Uh, so I, I know what's been going on the last four or five months, and there's many different layers and levels of how this has affected people um, psychologically uh, and psychiatrically for the people that haven't been able to follow up with their medications. For children, you know, starting off with just kids first, kids, you know, they, <laughs> they need to be in, you know, uh, stimulated and they need that human human interaction. And that's really important for their development, especially younger children. Younger children definitely need that. So I think it is, it's going to affect them. We're probably going to see some 
uh, effects of this. We already have, which is a lot of just behavioral problems, um, you know, worsening of their ADHD because they haven't been able to actually been diagnosed appropriately or because the classroom, you know, provided some kind of structure and some kind of, you know, and so um, oversight and whatever and whatnot and feedback to the parents and feedback to the psychologist, psychiatrist, where that's not happening. So I think that's a lot of that's going on. A lot of abuse is going on, you know, at home, like schools used to be kind of a respite and also picking up on abuse going on at home from the, you know, uh, parents or whether it was foster care or whether it was, you know, substance abuse related issues. So there is a lot of that, unfortunately, because of the pandemic. That's a huge, you know, adverse outcome on children. I think in terms of going back to school, ultimately you have to make a decision. You know, every district is different. You kind of have to look at what how it is. I know Sanjay Gupta had a great article uh, recently where he was talking about his kids going back to school. And I think he mentioned that like he didn't want his kids to go back to school because he did the research and looked into it. And, um, you know, he just didn't think that it was wise that the, the, the study, the epidemiological, you know, study of the data in that school district didn't, you know, he didn't feel comfortable. I think you can do it as long as you stick to the rules. And that, yes. and that means, <laughs> as me, and that yeah. means masks and that means distancing and right. of course washing hands. And that's very hard for kids to do. <laughs> but, but I mean, yeah. listen, kids, I mean, there's, yeah. they follow the rules, right? They don't want to get in trouble if they don't follow the For the rules, most part, yeah. Right? I think limited, you know, like I said, a district or district, right? Yeah. So if some district crazy, you know, outbreak right now, then I probably wouldn't obviously sending my kids there. Yeah, obviously, you know, the school in Georgia where they showed the picture in the hallway where yeah. like everyone's together. No, you can't have that. If, right, if right. If you can't, if you're going to have that, you can't send them back to school. Exactly. Yeah, because health is more important at the end of it all. But yes, in terms of mental health, it is very important for kids to get back and to get back as soon as possible, which is why it's very important for us to follow the rules uh, when a pandemic happens that are, you know, that are recommended, like isolation and uh, wearing a mask, because it's just, it, it'll help get rid of it quicker. It'll and if help, it's a money issue because you don't yeah. have the funds, well, then you know what? The government needs to step in. They the do. The government this, needs to step in and get yeah. the funds to get this country back on track. And if that means giving more money to school so that they can, you know, yeah. go back to school safely, then so be it. It needs to be done. Right. Because otherwise you're right. It's going to linger on a lot longer and there's going to be, uh, you know, there's, then it's going to turn into one of those things where like a year later, we're still having the same conversation when like in New York, they did it. It sucked for people. It, there was a complete lockdown for almost 90 days, I think. But at the end of it, things are opening up now. And, yeah. and they over there, they don't feel, you know, that scared of sending their kids to school. They really, they really don't. I mean, the, you know, the, the rate, the, the COVID rate over there is much less now uh, than and almost most places, the rest of the country almost, or at least big cities, rest of the big cities. So I think going back to school is important. They're probably going to do, they're doing a partial thing. We're doing some video or, uh, you know, um, Zoom, whatever classes, uh, and then some in person so it is important to do some in person as long as they have proper social distancing they might need to limit you know the activities that the kids do obviously um, but kids do need to interact with other kids and for the most part from what i'm reading and you can correct me kids don't seem to be getting it as bad but they can still spread it right mm -hmm. they can still be spreading the virus which is you know almost just as bad then and what's the point they're coming and spreading it to other people so that kind of it's still up in the air. Uh, I, I can't really say, but I can just tell you from psychiatric perspective, yes, those the things that I mentioned with kids, there's a lot of that. There's a lot of behavioral problems. Yeah. And there's a lot of things that because of lack of social engagement, a lot of anxiety, a lot of depression um, that's happening in children. Now that's kids. Adults, it's also happening. So, I you mean, know. you work uh, in the psychiatry department of the hospital yeah. where they come into the ER, right? And then right. You're, you're called to go and see them. So what is... What would you say is the biggest difference or something that you've noticed that's bigger in terms of before and after the pandemic started? What's the biggest difference? Um, so uh, originally, like when this pandemic started initially, I mean, it was like this kind of total fear, right? It was like this fear of, um, you know, almost like an apocalyptic fear, paralyzing fear, apocalyptic fear, what do you want to call it? And it did seem that way, even to us, right? Even to us, we didn't quite know what was going to happen. Is this going to turn out to be like the movie Contagion where there were millions of people dead? Uh, or, or, you know, like the Spanish flu, which is which was way worse, um, and, and the plague. So yeah, I think there was a lot of concern about that. Initially, most of the psych patients that were coming to outpatient clinics, they just stopped coming and the clinic stopped taking them too. So there was a double, there was a fear of the patient's coming to see, tr receive treatment, and then the healthcare workers. A lot more people are dying at home with heart attacks because yeah. they don't want to go to the hospital. They don't want to go to the hospital. Right. And a lot of psychiatric people, uh, patients that are, 
you know, um, have uh, mental illness that they need to, you know, follow up with. And it's important for them to follow up, you know, went off their medic, you know, went off their medications because they weren't able to get them or, um, you know, inpatient, they kind of like scurried them out from inpatient to get them home. A lot of the partial hospitalizations. So these are partial hospitalizations just for those who aren't aware, um, is a type of, it's, it's, it's a step down from a total inpatient hospitalization. And it's a good thing for a lot of people. And back in the old days, you see, you know, obviously keep you in hospitals longer. Now they kind of do something like if you can function somewhat in the community, but have to be in a program for four or five hours a day, have some kind of like supervision, monitoring of your treatment, engagement, engagement and treatment in groups, you know, that helped a lot of people and um, kept them busy and kept them, you know, so that could be four or five days a week. Uh, that was a huge thing. And that was a huge thing that kept people from really getting over to the edge of where they needed to be hospitalized, where they decompensated. So those programs shut down. Then, of course, well, you know, the logical outcome was that the, a lot of those patients did decompensate. They were fragile. They were so. So obviously, the yeah. pandemic it stresses psychiatric illness, mental yes, illness. Absolutely. Even if you don't have mental illness, it stresses people out to have it's a lot of anxiety, anxiety depression. Yeah, a lot of anxiety, a lot of depression. A lot of I, I, I've seen so many cases of just in the psych ER of just people coming and saying they have COVID, they have COVID, they're going to die. So even even a lot of people that were maybe just on the cusp where they were anxious about getting an illness, and now all of a sudden a pandemic happens and no one knows what it's about. Everyone thinks they have it. Right. You know, they have it. They have it. You know, I'm talking well, about this population. And, and only to add fuel to that fire is that yeah. the testing is so haphazard, right? And such a crapshoot. There's you know, there's different kinds of tests. There's different manufacturers for all these tests, and right. they all have their own sensitivities and specificities, meaning they all have their own accuracy. Yeah. And on top of that, some of it depends on technique. Uh, I've done a autopsy video where I talked about they looked at 12 autopsy cases where they died of pulmonary ARDS, so pneumonia and blood clots in the lungs. That's how they all died. Nine out of the 12 who died when they looked at these autopsies. They actually had it in their lungs, but they didn't have it in their throat. So it's possible that you have the virus and then you go to do your swab. And no matter how accurate that test is, if that virus isn't there, it's not going to pick it up. It's going to be a false negative in that case. So yeah. that's just another possibility. So the bottom line is the testing is such a crapshoot. Yeah. It's only fueling, you know, that fire about, well, I think I have, I think I have it. It could be a false negative and they could be right. Yeah. Or they could be wrong. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. There's a lot of, well, you know, we call this illness anxiety disorder where, you know, this severe anxiety of having, you know, an illness. Um, and, you know, they're, they're well, formerly known as hypochondriac. Um, so that's the, that's a new terminology. But that we've seen a lot of. Yeah, absolutely. I've seen a lot of, of it personally. I talked to colleagues. They've seen a lot of that. So from the patient perspective, yes, definitely a lot of depression, the lack of human connection and contact, a lack of outpatient programs you know, follow with the programs for, to, to, you know, to check up the psychiatrist, psychologist, a lot of it's psychologists, right? Because psychiatrists, they just do medication management. That is what psychiatrists do, you know, and psycho psychologists are the ones that are spending more time, 45 minutes to an hour with the patient every week, as opposed to, you know, once a month uh, or once every three months in some cases. So once a week, when you have that connection with the therapist, that therapist is the only person sometimes that you feel is even listening to you. You know, and that's what problems. a lot of times people need most is someone yeah. to vent to, someone to get things off their chest, tell how they're feeling. Because yeah, yeah, exactly. reality is a lot of people don't want to hear it, right? Like, I don't want to hear about your, you know, don't be a Debbie Downer. I don't want to hear about your sorrows. <laughs> right. yeah. I don't want to hear about that. But the reality is people need to vent. People need to spill their guts, get things off their chest, and they need someone to talk to. And, and even with Zoom, because, uh, again... From talking from personal experience, knowing psychologists and, and patients that go and see psychologists and friends that go to see psychologists, like, yeah, Zoom is is great. I'm glad that we have that technology because it definitely, you know, without Zoom, without that technology, it'd be even worse. But Zoom doesn't really establish that. I think that's the one thing that psychiatry, the psychiatric profession and mental health profession, I should say, including social workers, psychologists, nurses, everyone, is that there nothing really beats an in-person human connection. Right. And I think the pandemic has taught us that. We never had to go through something like this. All the other, you know, problems that we've we've so far f faced like the financial crisis this or that, there was always a human connection that we could fall back on and a safety net in terms of our families and, and fam uh, friends and even strangers. But now everyone wants, you know, they're scared. No one wants to really, even your family is like, hey, we don't really want to see you necessarily. Someone's high risk. And I get it. It's probably the smarter thing to do for their medical health. But there is that lack of 
human connection and that if anything has made us realize how precious that really is we are a social animal no doubt even something as simple yeah. as a hug you know like, exactly yeah. which is always why it's made me even more perplexed when i'm like well then you would think that people would say okay this is a sacrifice i have to make for the greater good because i know that being in touch with other people in the long run is what's gonna is what humanity is all about that's the irony about then it. why not yeah. sacrifice it for a little bit of time to follow the you know protocol so that we can get back to it quicker that's why the whole <laughs> loss, this the master impinging on my freedom yeah i get the sentiment but really in the long run it's the opposite because if you just Absolutely. suck it up now you'll have more freedom after it's all yeah, over yeah. with right so so i'm sure look i'm sure there's gonna be a lot of prescription of ssris <laughs> it's gonna be a lot of ssris prescribed anti you know anxiety meds so what would be you know to someone watching who is stressed out, having lots of anxiety, depression, what would be something that you could say to them that maybe that, that could help them cope with it or deal with it? Um, I would say that if you could use uh, mindfulness meditation, there's a bunch of really good apps actually that you could use on your phone just to help calm your anxiety. Is it going to give you human connection? No, but you know, there's some audible stuff that you'd hear it, audio stuff when, when these, in these apps that help you with deep breathing and mindfulness. That's what I would say first and foremost. And actually that's the connection between psychiatry and pulmonary is, yeah. is the mind breathing connection. Actually our breathing is controlled in the pons and medulla of our brain. It's the very most core aspect of our brain. The yeah. last thing to go when someone is brain dead is that very core aspect of our brain. It's the pons and medulla. So that controls the breathing. And when you slow down, especially if you close your eyes, right? It's like yeah. you take a deep breath, and you breathe out, the anxiety dissipates, right? Yep. And really that's what anxiety is. It's fear of out there. Yeah. It's the fear of what's going on. Exactly. But at the end of the day, you're still alive, right? It's a lot of fear is, is irrational, right? I mean, a lot of it's irrational. It's what we, you know, we do CBT, co uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. That's what it's based off of. It's based off of our jumping to the worst possible scenario and not entertaining the other possibilities, which are usually the case, right? So everything, everyone jumped to the worst possible fear for initially is that we're all dying. And then everyone went to the other one, which is that oh, this is all just a hoax. And so it was all just, you know, I think it was, if there's the truth always lies somewhere in the middle, right? That's where generally, that's what we're taught um, since we're kids basically, but no one, you know, ever, you know, in crisis situations, it's hard to, you know, recollect that memory or that teaching. So I would say that CBT is really good. CBT for anxiety is really good. And it's something that you can even do through groups on Zoom, even though, again, not the same human connection, but I used to run a group uh, and it's like, you know, a short, you know, 12 week or, or 16 week, however, you know, whatever benefits you. But it usually just takes that much amount of time to start to practice it. I would say that's one thing that really helps. Two, CBT, mindfulness, meditation. CBT, mindfulness, med meditation, diet, exercise, sleep. Those are obviously the things that nobody in the in the medical, uh, you know, field, uh, especially on all these shows, talks too much about. I know there are some obviously doctors that do. Because right, everything is related. The mind is the yeah. body, and the body is the mind, yeah. and everything is affected by everything else. Nothing is in isolation. The the yeah. mind is not in isolation. The brain is not. The body is not. What you put in your body, what you're eating exercising, getting good sleep, all these things can impact you from a mental health standpoint. Absolutely. If you get good sleep, that's why you're irritable. That's why you're mm -hmm. more anxious if you're not getting good sleep. Uh, lack of exercise, you notice if you exercise, you have less anxiety, you deal with stress better. Also exercise helps you sleep better. So it's all yeah. related. Yeah, and I think one of the things is that most Americans get poor quality sleep right? Because they work two jobs and then they're eating fast food. They're overweight. So it's a lot of it's like, you know, because of obstructive sleep apnea or some other things. Or but you're also, tired, man. You're now tired. You want to eat junk food because exactly. you're tired. So right? eating before you your go cravings. to sleep, drinking coffee throughout the day, yeah. um, lack of exercise, right? Ex if you exercise, you will sleep better. I mean, there's these are just things that Amer mo Americans compared to most countries, developed countries, don't do they just yeah. don't do and yeah. that is why we're not the happiest country despite working and making all this money supposedly i mean honestly the two <laughs> biggest things you can do just for you know general health is i mean i'd say i go four let's say four so eating healthy so nutrition dieting yeah. uh exercising getting good sleep and if you smoke cigarettes to quit smoking Th those four things right there are like the 
the things that you can do to have the biggest impact overall on your health, both your mental yep. health and your physical health. Yeah. So yeah, bad habits like drinking and smoking yeah. um, excessively. So I, I think the pen, you know, one of the conversations I think I remember hearing was that, so when this shutdown originally happened, um, you know, people were out of jobs and they're like, okay, well, what, what are you going to do in the spare time? And, or, you know, now that you're not working fine, you're not making money, but you also have an opportunity. There was an opportunity. I think that was kind of lost, which was, America, someone should have come out and said, hey, listen, your chances of um, not succumbing to this illness or getting gravely sick are related to your sleep and health. Like obesity, let's just, let's, obesity, high blood pressure, diabetes, these are the biggest risk factors yeah. for people who get sick with COVID. Exactly. And, COVID. and yeah. these are all related to metabolic, the metabolic syndrome we hear about, right? So exactly, yeah. having high blood pressure, having a bigger waist or more fat. Yeah. And, uh, you know, having high LDLs, lower HDLs, prediabetes or diabetes, this is all the formula right. of metabolic syndrome. And this is the formula of who has worse disease for yeah. COVID and Ex just in general. Exactly. I know you've talked about this. Mike has talked about this, you know, in a great detail in a lot of his videos. But I have to mention it, too, because in psychiatry, you know, when most of my patients that come to see me, they want pills. They want something. They want something for the anxiety, something to help them sleep. So now they're they're getting medication to help them sleep, to help this, to help that. Four or five different medications. They all contribute to some degree to metabolic syndrome in their own way. So no one ever actually gets better. Not only that, <laughs> you know, they become medically, addicted to them. There's and, addiction, you know, from some of these and medications. Then it messes with their REM sleep, and then absolutely, it yeah. just totally messes. It just messes yeah. everything up. It's like a domino effect. And don't get me wrong, there are people that need the medications, and and or you know they're going through a rough period in their life they need it and then of course there's the people that are chronic you know just like diabetes they're always going to need certain medications the type 1 diabetes are going to need insulin that's a fact you're right so okay yes i'm not saying that there are people that need it they do yes metformin is good for pre-diabetes and yeah, type 2 diabetes there are medications. Yes, metformin is good for that but is it as good as eating healthy diet and, and exercising not. I don't think absolutely, not. That. absolutely not absolutely not absolutely not yeah and you can decrease the need of those medications and the doses and how much you know and how many medications just by a healthy lifestyle same goes for you know high blood pressure same goes for you know ldls the bad cholesterol right you know a statin medication like crestor or whatever absolutely. not nearly as good as diet and exercise yeah high, you know high blood pressure drugs not nearly as good as diet, diet and, and exercise, exercise. Yeah, so yeah. And diet and exercise just help, just, it helps in so many other ways. Again, you know, even just from a medical point of view that Mike's talking about, I'm talking about just from a long-term, even cognitive functioning over the long run, talking about like maybe reducing your risk factors for Alzheimer's, reducing your risk factor for cognitive impairment, even if it's not full on Alzheimer's, just impairment. Don't you want to live to 90 and be sharp? and be out there running and swimming right. and playing with your great grandkids who wouldn't but no one thinks that long term and they just think that surgeries and medications is what's going to make them live that long you know what surgeries and medications might make you live to that long but i don't know if it's going to keep you sharp as a tack but now this all this <laughs> you know? metabolic syndrome that we're talking about and people not thinking long term same thing with you know what you're talking about with you know cognitive ability and staying sharp we all think that you know this is long term but now with covid it's short term yeah. as well it's short term, because yeah. Because of the risk factors with COVID. And this would have been a good opportunity, I think, for the government to come out and say, listen, we're going to have to be on shutdown for a couple months, but how about set yourself a goal? Why don't we set up a goal for health, like five or 10 pound weight loss? Let's just even start small, running 10, 15 miles Actually, a day so you, you know have what? more I'm time. Gonna, I think one of my next videos, <laughs> yeah. I'm going to do a video on testing because it's a very complicated subject, but yeah. I also want to do a video on the metabolic syndrome and what we just discussed, right. you know, kind of really dive deep into that because you want to talk about things that people can do to actually, you know, make an impact on their chances of COVID and just yeah. overall, you know, general health. And, and I mean, look, the, your abdominal circumference is a huge determinant of the illnesses you're going to have. You know, I mean, yes, there are people that are what we call skinny fat, that even though if they look skinny, they're unhealthy inside. But the one thing that we all know for a fact that we can see is, you know, people could have said, I'm going to try to trim my abdominal circumference a little bit because mm -hmm. that's directly related to all the, a lot of these metabolic syndromes. And they could have said, you know, like, this is what we want people to do. And this is what will reduce the number of deaths. 
to, you know what I mean? Like we don't, we're, we might not have a vaccine for another year and a half. What are we going to do? Just keep dying at the same rate? No, we no. can try to stop it. So we can try you, to eat healthy. You can do super. everything that you can to prevent it. And if you do get it, all these things will also maximize your potential right. to fight it the best that your body And can. most of it is diet. I know people, when you say diet and exercise, all of a sudden they're like, I don't want to go to the gym. Okay. Gyms are closed. I get it. And a lot of people are like, gyms are closed. I know you did a video on that's no excuse to stop working out because you can still do stuff. I used to go to gym all the time. I think Mike did too. Part of going to the gym, I'll admit, was it helped keep me, you know, like once I got to the gym, I had no choice but to work out, right? So it was a rigid and, you know, it helped structure, provided me with structure. Environment too. Environment. environment. Yeah. So you go there, you're like, okay, everyone's working. I'm going to put in work. Now that I'm here, I'll put in an hour, hour and a half. Whereas if you're at home, you might, you know, procrastinate, only do 20 I'll minutes. Do it later. Yeah. And then you do it later. Or I'm not going to do that much or I'm going to skip this, that. So I do admit that the gym had its benefits for those people that actually went to what they wanted to go work out. But um, that's not an excuse to, to say, okay, well, now that the gym is closed, I'm just going to stop. Or for the people that never went to the gym to say, oh, well, I never went to the gym anyways. Oh, now there's even, you know, now I can't go, even if I wanted yeah. to go. <laughs> that's why, you know, I want to talk more about this in yeah. like my next video. But um, anyway, Dr. Hizbe Ali. Yes. Lefty. Mike. Thanks so pleasure. much. You're a rock star. <laughs> so are you, my All friend. Right. Thanks for having me. So anyway, thanks for watching and be on the lookout for my next couple of videos. Probably my next one's going to be on testing. Very complicated subject that I want to simplify. And then also I do want to talk about uh, exercise and nutrition and the different things that you can do to get you metab metabolically and cognitively in the best shape you can. So see you in the next one.